to know that we are recording this webinar and it will be available on our website uh, later in the week. And perhaps um, if Jada or Dr. Julie would like to also house this on their websites, it will be available to them. Uh, if anybody does have a question or a comment, please make sure to type it in at the bottom and we will do everything we possibly can to get to everybody's questions and comments. But without further ado, it is an honor and privilege to uh, introduce you to both of our speakers this evening. First, I'm gonna start with Dr. Judy, Julie Capiola, who secretly is my favorite pediatrician on my children's practice at Premier Pediatrics. Uh, Dr. Julie is an IBCLC. She's a partner at Premier Pediatrics, home of the first month. She completed her residency at Yale New Haven Hospital, where she was awarded the prestigious Morris Krosnick MD Award. This award is given annually to the senior resident who best exemplifies the qualities of caring, compassion, dedication, and the pediatrician whom you most like to take care of your own child. Dr. Capiola sees patients at the Manhattan location at Premier Pediatrics. We are also going to be hearing from Jada Shapiro, who another personal connection was part of the delivery of my first son. Jada is a maternal health expert and the founder of Boober, a health tech startup where expectant parents and new families find expert in-person pregnancy to postpartum care providers like doulas and lactation consultants. She also founded Birthday Presence, New York City's most trusted source for childbirth classes and doula training, which has supported over 20,000 parents since 2002. She's a birth and postpartum doula, childbirth educator, lactation counselor, birth photographer, mother, and stepmother. Jada has assisted hundreds of births for first-time parents, A-list celebrities, and everyone in between. So it is my honor to hand this over to both of you lovely ladies. Thank you again so much for being a part of this evening's event. Thank you. Thanks, Paige. Thank you, Paige, for having us. Yes, and thank you so much for the Motherhood Center and all the amazing work that you have been doing. So we're super, super happy to be part of this um, and having this talk with, with you and with, yeah, so. Let's take it away. Um, Dr. Capiola and I have had lots of opportunities to talk together and share information. So I guess we always, you know, it's been a few weeks actually since we've talked. So let's update, you know, everybody and just here in terms of, you know, today we're talking about newborn health and safety and lactation as you are a pediatrician and a lactation consultant. Um, so, you know, can you keep us posted on the latest in terms of obviously everybody always wants to know, okay, to, to breastfeed um, or, you know, while during COVID-19, talk to us about that, just the basics. Um, well, certainly there isn't a time when breastfeeding is more important than at a time of a pandemic because of the immunity conferred and the relationship between a mother and, and a newborn, there is just so much protection. Um, so if there's been, you know, COVID's everywhere, as we know, um, hopefully plateauing in the New York area, as we're looking at these numbers day by day, um, if there's been an exposure, but a mom feels well, um, and is currently breastfeeding her child's infant, newborn infant, toddler, that certainly should be continued. Um, if symptoms show up, then we, you know, we proceed differently um, with, more, with more care. But certainly if um, at a time like this, it's, it's super important to breastfeed. So then I think maybe we go into what happens at the hospital, you think, Jada? Yeah, I think that would be helpful for everybody to hear because right now we know that um, some parents, if they are testing positive, if the birthing parent is testing positive, there is a recommendation to separate um, from skin to skin contact, but we know that it's not been consistent in all hospitals. So I am curious what your stance on that is. What is your current um, position? Can a parent have a choice in that? Can you talk to us a little bit about it? So the CDC and the American Academy of Pediatrics came up with guidelines a few weeks ago. And prior to that, actually in early March, there were guidelines put forth by American Academy of Breastfeeding Medicine. Um, that was early in March before, and we have much more information since then. But nonetheless, CDC and AEP came up with guidelines a few weeks ago about what to do um, in a few different scenarios. So um, 
So say at this point, we have someone who's recovering. So a mom goes into the hospital and gives birth and she was recovering from COVID, but she's been asymptomatic. Um, her symptoms you know, had started at least two weeks prior. Um, there is no reason for that mom and that baby to then be separated. And the mom and the baby would be in the room together um, with no specific guidelines for you know, needing to be six feet away or what have you in the hospital room. At least that's how the hospital where we're, we're affiliated, which is NYU Medical Center, that's how they're proceeding. Um, so next scenario, you have someone who maybe has some symptoms or not, but is certainly a person under investigation, a PUI. So maybe someone in you know, one of their close contacts had symptoms, or uh, maybe they have some symptoms that are vague, but we don't have a confirmed COVID diagnosis. So in that scenario, a lot of the hospitals, based on these guidelines, are recommending separation after birth of mother and baby. Um, so they're recommending total separation and the baby is put into like an isolate and also isolated from other infants in a separate newborn care area. Um, and that go, that's the same until, by the way, a positive test would come back and then they would, you know, either continue that separation or reunite the mother infant group, the dyad, um, if there's a negative test. So that's the second scenario. Then, of course, if there is a positive COVID test. Oh, and by the way, I should say that certainly at NYU, and I suspect a lot of the other hospitals, although I can't comment on those, all of the moms are being tested in L&D, in labor and delivery anyway. That's the protocol there. Um, can't comment, like I said, about the other hospitals. Um, so then you have a positive, a COVID positive mother. Then the recommendation from the CDC and the AAP is to separate. Um, now the guidelines say that someone, that a mom can decline to, to agree to separation. Um, and then the mom would wear a mask, um, wash, wash hands or somehow sanitize, whether it's, you know, alcohol-based sanitizer, soap and water, um, hands and breasts in case those breasts are exposed and there may be some respiratory droplets of the virus present on the breast, um, and then breastfeed, but then immediately separate and the baby would need to stay six feet away for any other care, um, any other time when feeding isn't actively happening. Um, and then the same thing would go if the mom was choosing to pump. You would also do mask wearing, hand sanitizing, cleansing the breasts with either you know, alcohol-based cleanser, soap and water, and then pump. And then all of the pumping equipment would then be cleaned as well as the bottles, et cetera, prior to them being fed to the baby by a healthy caregiver. And so if the, if the scenarios. Yeah, so if the lactating parent um, were to cleanse the breast, I just want to follow up on that because I think people may have questions about that. Um, the alcohol-based cleanse, that would be like a sanitizer, essentially? A sanitizer or just soap and water because um, the virus is very sensitive to good old soap and water. You know, when you're washing your hands, sing the happy birthday song and um, cleanse properly. Same idea would go. So a very good cleansing with soap and water or alcohol-based, yeah. Okay. And yeah, I just wanted to clarify on that. If if they are breastfeeding after, do you need to remove that sanitizer? Um, right? You would so you would sanitize and then put the baby mm -hmm. in the breast. Probably as long as it's not moist, moist still. As long as you're dry, it should be yeah. fine. Okay, cool. Just wanted to clarify that. Definitely um, clarify the details here. Yeah, definitely. Um, and so some people would then, you know, choose to pump and express and have a healthy caregiver. Um, of course, some people also, and we want to just put that out there to everybody that, you know, at, at Boober um, and at Motherhood Center, and I'm sure at, at Premier as well, you can speak that, that um, you know, while breastfeeding may not be the choice that everybody makes, that everybody needs to make their own individual choice um, as to how they are, are feeding their baby. And I just wanted to acknowledge that, especially to, um, due to, you know, sometimes mental health, um, whatever's going on with somebody, their mental health, their lack of sleep, whatever their choices or reasons are, I want you all to know that we support you in whatever choice you're making. Um, we're going to have a lot of questions, certainly around lactation um, today and how to how to work with that, but I just wanted to acknowledge that as well. I certainly think that a continued relationship and discussion between 
family, parents, and a pediatrician is crucial. Um, we always say in these visits, it's a, we want to speak to mom about what her goals are for feeding her baby. And what we do is never with pressure, but it's to help you as a mom reach those feeding goals. And we will do whatever we can to help you get there. And there should never be pressure. Um, moms have to take care of themselves first. Absolutely. And, and I think, you know, that's, that's really, really clear. At a time like this, when all of us are a bit out of our comfort zone and without the extended support systems that often are in place after we have a baby. I mean, we can, we'll speak to this a bit more. Yeah, we will definitely, we'll talk about virtual postpartum support and, and seeing, you know, coming to you virtually and how that works. And actually, like, I, I mean, I think, why don't we extend this in a little? So we're getting, we're getting home and, right, um, so if there has been separation of, of the baby, can you tell us exactly again, when, when would you be able to, um, how many days post fever, et cetera, you can get back into close contact? So, the, so there are two ways to go. There's the test, the non-tested approach. I mean, this wouldn't be the case with NYU because the baby and the mom would both have been tested in the hospital. Um, but say that was unknown. There's the symptom-based approach where you say at least seven days from the onset of symptoms, as well as 72 hours fever-free with improving, don't have to be resolved, but certainly improving symptoms. And both of those criteria need to be present. It's not one or the other. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, and that reconnection would be recommended according to the CDC and the AAP protocols. Okay. Great, thank you. And let's also talk about a lot of people have this question out there. So we're getting home. This is probably the first time in, I don't know, I don't wanna say history, but in a quite a long time that we can all remember where parents are coming home and potentially don't have any in-person support, right? And they're not going out, they're not having grandparents necessarily come over, but we have a lot of questions about that I'd love to throw to you. When can grandparents first mm -hmm. say they come over, right? When can, um, do you think, do you have opinions on that? Can you share that with everybody? Because a lot of questions out there. I mean, I think that right now, that depends a lot on where, where you live, um, in, in the country and where the, the pandemic is in terms of numbers of cases and how those cases are trending, whether things are still heading on the, up, on the upswing, if things are plateauing, if things are heading down. And if you're in a low prevalence area, that is an area where there aren't many cases, the, diff, the, you know, the recommendations would be a little bit different than where they are in sort of our tri-state New York, Connecticut, northern New Jersey area where the cases are so high and responsible for most of the deaths and cases in the enti entire United States. So in an area where there are so many cases, I think we just need to be extra cautious about other people who are then coming into our, our circle of safety, um, which right now it's recommended to only be the nuclear family, um, the people that live in one, in one home apartment, condo, you know, house, or what have you. Um, because bringing someone in from elsewhere brings risk to the baby, potentially. And, you know, that family who has just been in the hospital, you know, also could have some risk for someone who is older, like a grandparent, who already just by age likely is in the higher risk category. So the risks really do go both ways. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Thank you. I know it's it's on a lot of people's minds trying to navigate these bubbles and when do we get to expand and and introduce and all of that. So um, I think one of the the other questions that a lot of people have about when they get home is, can I safely go out with my baby? And if so, how do I do it? What are your recommendations, especially in a hot spot? But people may you know not be from a hot spot. We'll see where people are. I mean, look, we all need to get out in the open. I'm a mom of three. Like my kids need their outdoor time like everyone's do. I, I need them to have their outdoor time. Um, but we all need that. And that's really important for everyone's mental health, okay? Um, but try to find a time in the day when it may be quieter on a walk. Look, 
families with newborns are up at any hour at any time. So potentially doing an early morning walk or a later evening walk when families are already inside and maybe having dinner, et cetera, it might be a quieter time and it might be easier to have that social distancing. Um, and then you can take a walk in the stroller with the carrier, cover the baby, wear your mask, et cetera, and try to take sort of the off the beaten path you know, ways around the neighborhood or the park where or there are fewer, where there's less traffic or there are fewer people. And, and do you, are, are people putting masks on babies? Do you recommend that? I mean, I've seen it. What, what is your thought? It's not really recommended. And we would worry from a suffocation standpoint and SIDS and there are too many risks. Um, so I would say no. <laughs> Just want to be clear and put that, put that out there as people. I, I can't even get my three-year-old to wear it and, you know, so let alone a younger toddler or certainly a baby, but that's even more for safety than for practical reasons. So speaking on, on kind of, you know, obviously limiting our visiting, um, I, I wanted to talk to you and put out to the community about the pediatrician visits. So now that we've been through this for some amount of time, still would like to hear from you. So what are the most important pediatric visits that people should be doing now that you've had some time to get into doing pediatric visits mm -hmm. in telehealth? What's that been like? What, what can you diagnose through, through telehealth and what, what do, does somebody need to come in for at this point? So an in-person newborn visit within a couple of days of discharge from the hospital is crucial. And this is even more important now because moms are being are uh, their discharge from the hospital is expedited um, to often postpartum day one, the day after delivery or postoperative day two, which is two days after a C-section. So it's even more important that a baby is evaluated in person more quickly because a number of things, babies lose weight, they develop jaundice. I mean, ph their physiology, their circulation, their breathing changes a lot in those first couple of days. So it's very important that a baby has an in-person evaluation, a heart lung exam, um, jaundice and weight evaluations. Those are all crucial. So certainly that first visit. Also, if babies are leaving very quickly, and I don't think this is happening much, um, but if they're leaving less than 24 hours, then the baby may need to be seen to have the New York State newborn screen drawn. And that needs to be done within three, 72 hours. Right. So that's another subset reason to get seen quickly. But babies need to be seen. And routine well child care is recommended up through age two right now by the American Academy of Pediatrics in person well child care. Because a, a telehealth visit where a, a parent or someone else is doing like a quick measurement and then just having a discussion about development isn't all that is needed in that age group. We, a physical exam is essential. Eyes on in person by a physician or a, a, a healthcare provider is really important so that things are not missed, developmental delays. I mean, heart, um, heart problems, congenital heart problems can show themselves in you know, the middle of the first year of life. And if a, ch a checkup is not done in a timely way, within weeks of when it should be done, something like that can be missed. And that has huge implications for you know, that child's future health. And then of course, vaccination. So it's really important that in the time of a pandemic, and this has been said by politicians, this has been said by, um, by you know, in, in the newspapers and social media, but in the time of a pandemic, we need to prevent vaccine preventable illness. That is really important. The last thing we need on top of a pandemic when things reopen is that then there's a spike in measles again, or mumps, or in German measles, rubella, things like that, diseases like this we do not need on top of a pandemic. So, thank you. Sort of that discussion. <laughs> No, thank you. And so how are you dealing now um, with, with parents coming in? How are you keeping people safe? You know, are they, are they driving and parking and waiting? I'm not, currently, I'm not currently seeing patients in our office, but mm -hmm. the doctors that are doing in-person checkups in our office are, it's only a physician and a nurse in the office doing everything. Children come in, infants, children come in, everyone is pre-screened for symptoms. Um, and it only comes in with one caregiver, a healthy caregiver. Um, no siblings, not two at the moment. Um, and then they're brought directly into an examination room and then they are discharged immediately from that room. 
treatment. Everything is done soup to nuts by the nurse and the doctor who are masked and gloved. Um, and the rooms are cleaned. Um, we're not currently, our, my office, the doctor seeing patients are not currently doing um, sick visits in our office. We're managing via telehealth, certainly like respiratory issues, things like that, are not being seen in the office. We're managing everything that we can via telehealth. So, And so, you know, one of the things I know we've talked a few times about is this idea of, of how we're kind of watching our own baby. Are we, you know, are we weighing our own babies? We talked a bit about having scales at home, and now you've had, we've had a bunch of weeks to deal with this. Are you finding that more people have a scale at home? Are they I guess we're always on our side at, at Boober and, and on the lactation side, we're always worried about people over monitoring their babies, you know, and wanting to weigh it every, you know, every day or every, every other feed and getting anxious. And so I'm curious with more people having scales at home, um, how are you helping people not to over monitor, but to use it wisely? What's your recommendation or it thought on that? I've always said, as you say, we never recommend having a scale because then people tend to get sort of obsessed with and caught up in weights before and after feeds. And it can be very anxiety provoking to keep checking weights before and after. And then how much did the baby eat? Which side? Did the baby just make a wet or a dirty diaper? And how does that impact the weight now compared to the last official weight? But those weight checks every couple of days, which can be done sort of monitored and in, in that a team approach with your pediatrician, I think it can be done very well at home. And parents do have access. They've borrowed, they've ordered, they use pastry scales, kitchen scales. I mean, Amazon deliveries of scales, eh, you know, any which way to assess the baby's weight gain track. Because that is super important to monitor, especially in a baby who's exclusively breastfed. I mean, a baby who's getting bottle feeds and is, you know, having quantified how much milk is going in and how frequently it's much easier um, and much less anxiety provoking when we know the volume going in. True, right? We always, we always talk about that. And yet on the flip side, let's, let's talk to the community about um, how they can feel assured that the baby is, is thriving or doing well. Let's say they are exclusively breastfeeding. Um, and certainly that's one reason. So at Boober, you know, we connect people to virtual lactation consultants and virtual postpartum doulas in person before, but all virtual right now. And I think that's, that's always one of the biggest concerns parents have. It's like, how do I know that my baby is getting enough, right? Because when you're breastfeeding, you, you don't know the amount of ounces um, that are going in. So I'd love for you to talk to the community a little bit about um, how they can know. And before you actually answer that real quick, it would be helpful for everybody out there. You know, um, we always like to know where you live and how pregnant are you or do you have a baby? And if you don't mind typing that into the chat, that kind of helps us see, you know, who's out there. It helps us feel a little more connected to all of you. We know that what you're, you're going through. And again, remember that you can drop some questions into the chat, but we would love to hear just like how many weeks pregnant you are, how old is your baby, and where do you live? Let us know while Dr. Capiola goes back and then answers this question. How do we know that the baby is thriving or what signs should we look out for while we're alone? So early on, hopefully in the hospital, everyone is connected to a lactation consultant in, in house in the hospital. Um, so that you can, and the nurses, which who are phenomenal at assisting in this. Um, certainly the nurses at NYU were phenomenal. Um, but we watch the baby and how the baby's latching. We look at, at we look outwardly at how, how wide open that mouth is. Um, we watch for movement of the jaw in this area. We learn how to listen for swallows and gulps as the feed is going. Um, as the milk starts to come in, now when, when the milk first comes in, that engorgement phase, it can be tricky to know sort of fullness and emptiness of the breast. It doesn't really happen because there's sort of swelling and fluid changes and things like that. But I, over, the coming, over the following few days after that engorgement period, there is a fullness of the breast and then there's sort of a lighter or looseness that happens during the course of a feed. Also, babies, when they first latch on, are, are tense, they're hungry. So they tend to be tightly fisted, you know, elbows flexed, knees up, ankles flexed. And as they feed, and we look at those outward signs, like I talked about, the gaped open mouth, the movement of the jaw, the listening to the swallows, then you look at your baby. Um, all of those joints start to relax. 
the elbows relax, the ankles, the knees, the hips, and the baby has like the drunken sailor look. We lift the arm and the arm sort of flops down. And that's a baby who's getting fuller and more satiated. Then some more objective findings. We start to monitor day by day numbers of wet and dirty diapers because that is in dirty diapers with stool. Um, are the most important assessment between, or more the more important assessment between those two things, wet and dirty. Um, numbers of dirty diapers are a very good assessment tool for whether a baby is getting wet. Um, so usually by day three, a baby has three wet and three dirty poops. Um, and with a lot of things, more is not better, but in terms of poops and in terms of this time in life, the more a baby is pooping, the more milk that baby is getting. So that's a really good, if your baby is making five, six, seven poopy diapers a day, that baby is getting milk. And obviously we still wanna do those weights, you know, every few days, but that's a really reassuring finding objectively for a mom to know that her baby is getting enough, enough milk. Great. Do you think I hit on all the high points, John? I think so, for sure. Yes, I think you, you got a lot of it, for sure. And I think that, you know, I guess I also want just, you know, how do you feel about um, people out there calling their pediatrician? I think some people feel worried to call the pediatrician or don't want to ask silly questions. And I think I, I always, as a postpartum doula, encourage people to reach out to their pediatrician anytime they feel uncertain because, you know, for us who work with babies, we, we know the realm of normal and it's really easy for us. But I want to acknowledge that new parents, it's, it's so much unknown and we can be really worried um, even more so now. Um, so, you know, how do you feel about people reaching out and, and talk, talk to us about that? Many a parent is tearful, overwhelmed, stressed out, overtired. We expect questions and we encourage you to reach out to us. I mean, I have spent on call on a Sunday evening, 20 to 30 minutes on a phone call with a new parent. And in the time of COVID, we've got another level of anxiety added to just the normal stressors of having a newborn. So we expect these calls. We want you to reach out to us. That is what we are here for. So please, please never hesitate as, as, a, as the birthing parent, or as the partner to reach out to us. And that is about newborn questions. That can also be a support system for the parents. We are that for you. Your OBs are also that for you, but we see you whether in person or virtually very frequently in those first few weeks of life, way more than your obstetrician has the you know, capability to do. So we are a perfect connection point for you to have to reach the services that you need. And we can help connect you to a support system, whether or not that's a virtual lactation consultant, whether that is a mental health provider, whatever you need, we are going to help connect you. And any pediatrician, I think, would say that. There are yeah. others on this forum right now, and I'm sure they would all agree with me. Yes, thank you. I just want everybody to know that out there, right? Like, we really want people yes. during COVID-19 especially not to feel alone. It's hard not to feel alone sometimes when you are in your house. Um, people, Jada, apologize for paging the on-call doctor now than ever before. Mm -hmm. They're like, I know you're dealing with bigger issues. Guess what? This is what we have to deal with. This is where, like, I'm not taking, we're not taking care of COVID patients. <laughs> but, you know, we're, we're trying to handle everyone else so that we can keep people healthy and out of needing acute care in an emergency room or admitted to the hospital. And we, we keep you healthy and at home. Yeah. Thank you. No, I think more important now. Yeah. It's, it's super important. And I think, you know, just in terms of, I think that's where some of these virtual visits actually really provide that, that sort of lifeline for people to feel connected, you know, so obviously reaching out to your pediatrician, um, you know, reaching out to the motherhood center if you need support and you're feeling like you're struggling or you're feeling like you, you are really um, having a hard time handling all of the emotions that go into all of this. Um, reaching out to Boober if you are feeling like you're in pain, you know, breastfeeding shouldn't be painful, right? Um, you know, and it's common, but it's not normal. So if it's really hurting you, we want you also to, to reach out because often when there's painful, 
breastfeeding, then you're not always making enough either, not stimulating, you know, quite enough. Um, so that's the something. The initial latch, I think it's important to say, we are, we are, I, it's funny, we get caught up in COVID and then sometimes I forget to talk about just the normal stuff. <laughs> yeah, right. And I think people want to know some of the normal that stuff. On, there's that wince moment. But after a few seconds, that should eat. But if there's persistent pinch or wince for a mom, that needs to be fixed. That is a sign that something is going on with the latch. And there are a number of things that could be going on with the latch. There could be a positional issue. Um, there could be a nipple shape and you know stretch issue. Um, there could be a small mouth issue. Some babies need you know manipulation to have you know, keep the jaw sort of open and forward. Um, there could be a tongue tie issue. I mean, that's just one of many problems that needs to be addressed. But I think a little bit of discomfort very quickly should ease, and if it doesn't, please reach out, okay? Yes, definitely. Yeah, and sometimes it's simple things even. <laughs> Breastfeeding is not punitive. <laughs> yeah. No, definitely. And sometimes it's simple things like how to reposition your, how you're holding the baby that actually can make a difference. And if we have to do this eight to 15 times a day, you know, um, we really do want to make sure that you feel comfortable while you're doing it and that we can adjust that and that can help bring in more milk if that's the issue. And of course, um, you know, if anybody needs, sometimes people reach out to lactation support because they are, um, they need help with figuring out they're building the milk supply, they might need to supplement, they might need, they might be, you know, choosing to be an exclusive pumper. There's so many kinds of people out there, and all of you are feeding your babies um, however you need to, to do that. So, um, you know, and the same with, with virtual postpartum support, um, I just wanna talk a little bit about doula support that um, while postpartum doulas in, in the old way of life, and maybe it will come back to that. We, we would come over and spend time with you. Um, and we're not doing that right now, but we are spending time in this way. And so maybe, whereas you would have booked me or a postpartum doula to come over for four hours before, maybe now I'm gonna change my day where I just visit you for one hour every few hours so I can really like pop in and provide continuity of care and allow people to ask like, is this normal? You know, is what I'm going through normal um, when you have a baby? We're in a whole new state. We have emotions up, down, all around. We have questions about, is this poop look right? Right? Um, you know, how many diapers do you get shown? A lot of diapers. Oh my gosh, it's kind of <laughs> How many photos message through our <laughs> messaging app, certainly. So, you know, we're all out here for you. And, and then prenatally, of course, to um, education. I see a lot of you are pregnant out there. So I'm going to give you a little um, at birthday presents. If you need a class to learn about lactation, um, you know, there's our information um, as well. So please reach out ahead of time. So let's kind of continue on, um, you know, in terms of some people ask, can I, can I have a, can I meet with a friend six feet away with my baby, with my son, you know, it's a complicated issue. And so we talked about the grandparents, do you know, do you have um, patients who are doing that, who are seeing their family members or friends at a, at a distance in the outside? Is there anything to say there to that? There are people doing that. I mean, this is so tricky because social distancing really should be six feet apart with brief encounters, right. not prolonged encounters a few feet apart wearing masks. That really does defeat the purpose of what social distancing is supposed to be. Um, I mean, being outside in a big yard may be a little bit longer, but it's still a little bit tricky. And right now we are supposed to be on pause and the social distancing rules don't, in, don't involve prolonged six feet apart contact because that, that's increasing your risk too. It's not just the distance, it's the length of time. Thank you. Yeah, I think we just need to kind of put that out there, you know, um, and and it's important to know that we we are all doing this together. Um, let's talk a little bit about older children. Anybody who has older children out there, um, if they come home, any any special precautions to deal with with baby and the older child in this time or. I mean, right now, the older child is also home. I feel like the older child is a bigger issue when we're not, 
you know, when, when we're not on pause, the child is in school or in daycare. And then I tell people, you know, wash the hands and face, maybe change some shirts. And then I tell people of the older child kiss the top of the head or the feet and not the hands or the face. Um, and I think right now, since everyone's sort of hunkered down at home, similar in terms of where to touch the baby, but it's less of an issue with the older child harboring some illness and bringing yeah. it home to the baby. Thank you. Um, I think those are questions we'll need to talk about at, you know, in the coming yeah. couple of months. Any other things like people should think about having at home ahead of time? Um, are, are you recommending that people, a lot of people ask this question um, to me, you know, should I be buying formula ahead of time? Which in the past we also usually said, no, just buy it on the corner if you need it, right? Like, are you finding that that is important? What about thermometers? What about, you know? I think always having for a newborn to have a rectal thermometer at home is very important because if we're concerned about a fever, we need to, you need to do a rectal temperature and you can buy the eight or nine dollar one at whatever local pharmacy. Um, I think everyone should have one of those at home, certainly no medications in a newborn. Um, but as for, wait, now I forgot the other part of the question. I remembered the thermometer part. Sorry. Yes, the thermometer was one. Um, formula, should anybody formula. have that? Hmm. I think that you can, I don't, I haven't walked into a, you know, a pharmacy in the city of late to see what is available. I mean, having a few bottles, a few two ounce bottles, wouldn't it be a bad thing? I mean, if you throw it out because you've never used it, that's not a bad idea. But if you needed to get formula, the formula companies, if you're having trouble accessing it, have, um, can let you know what retailers will, you know, have stock. And so you can reach out to any of the specific formula companies, at least the United US companies, um, and they can connect you to a retailer that can provide that formula for you. Thank and you. Having a few wouldn't be a bad thing at three in the morning when everything it goes to heck and it's, you know, you're stressed out. It's not bad to have a little lifeline. <laughs> and then what about medicines or other things for babies? You know, do they, what do you, what do you recommend people have at home? Um, I think, you know, having some kind of like a diaper cream or ointment and, but nothing else. I mean, infant Tylenol wouldn't be recommended at this point. Um, use medications for fever in the under eight week age group. Um, because we don't want to ever mask illness symptoms anytime, not just in the time of COVID. Um, so I wouldn't have any other medications, but topical stuff for, you know, diaper rash. Um, I always recommend, and this isn't really medical, but it's breastfeeding related, some kind of breastfeeding support pillow. Could it be more important? I encourage families, especially right now, if you go into the hospital, if, if you're able to bring a partner with you, that person cannot leave and come back. We say when you you come when that partner comes during labor, and once that person leaves, that person cannot come back. So, having all those supplies with you is really important. But a breastfeeding pillow, if you're going to breastfeed, is crucial. I think I agree. <laughs> I love. There's a new pillow that I really, really love, which well, I'm telling me it's it's really amazing, and everybody has been loving it. So since I I came across it, um, it's called it here. I'll type it. The BB Hug Me. And um, we actually, this sounds very salesy. I, I barely post or push products that I, you know, I don't think we need a lot of things, but they gave us a code. So you guys get, um, I think it's 10% off. It is, I don't know, you guys check it out. It's just really amazing because it actually is small and it's squishy and it, and it can be tied right onto you and it keeps the baby at the right height for breastfeeding rather than too low where people are always kind of leaning mm -hmm. down and you put another pillow. So I, I've been super loving it. We had it at our studio for several months and had lots of different people try it out before recommending it and everybody was just like this. So I wish I had it here. It's at my office. Um, anyway, I, I do think that's a good thing to have um, as well. It is really important to have the right setup for nursing. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I always, I sat on my couch, I would have, I had the breast friend, I used that for all three of my kids, and then I would have a, like a couch pillow right above it so that I could lean back. And that way you're not doing anything to support the weight of the baby. All of your, all your hands are doing is positioning, not no. weight supporting, because um, you need all hands on deck. No, like I want to grab my, I'm like, while you're talking, I'm just going to grab my, my baby, right? When you're, because a lot of people end up, 
kind of positioning and they have their, their hand really broken or they're really um, sitting with their shoulders up, they don't have arms. So, you know, that's, that's something we really want you all to think about getting into that comfortable pose if you can, or if we can support you to get there. Cause sometimes we find ourselves breastfeeding very uncomfortably and then, you know, we have shoulder pain and eight to 15 pain. times a day. It's going to cause a lot of problems right. if it's not done right every time, really. Yeah really creating, thinking about creating your nest and, um, and, and having a spot that feels comfortable with a foot rest with arms. You can breastfeed, of course, with a chair that doesn't have arms and you need to do that as well when you are at the dinner table, but um, kind of finding that comfy place where you will be quite a lot. Because in the beginning, we should say you're going, you know, if you are, if you are breastfeeding, you'll feel like all, all I'm doing is breastfeeding. That is a, a feeling that you may have in the beginning because we are feeding, you know, quite every hour to hour and a half sometimes. So um, a couple other people have asked some questions, so I wanna get those to you. Um, somebody has said, I have decided to have my mom come and stay with us anyway with the ba when the baby is born. And people have, have felt that she's quarantining before, um, driving to me. Two weeks before, something like that, great. Mm -hmm. Driving to me will join our household, but I am worried that I may get her sick from the hospital, from my going out. How likely is that? What precautions should we take when, when we combine the bubbles? Do you have a thought on that? I mean, L&D, labor and delivery, and the postpartum units um, really have things tightened up so that there aren't, there aren't people coming in and out, and um, all, all the moms are being tested as well. So it's, it's you know, nothing's fail safe, but they are really doing everything they can to make it a safe place um, that is free, that, you know, you're, you're not likely to contract disease. I mean, should we be extra cautious? Are you going to hug and kiss mom? Maybe that's not the best plan, but having those hands, um, I think, is really important for a lot of families. And we all have to weigh with any decision, benefits and risks. And I, I had my mom when I brought my first baby home, and I'm a pediatrician. Like, <laughs> I'm, an, I'm an expert in newborn and infant care. And having an extra set of hands when my, my partner, my husband was going back to work very quickly, I mean, I, I needed that, so I can understand. So look, we all weigh benefits and risks, be a little bit cautious, monitor and pay attention to your own physical symptoms and proceed accordingly. Yeah, thank you. Um, and speaking of paying attention to one's own symptoms as we, as we come to wind down, you know, if somebody, there's been a lot of questions like, what if I'm starting to feel sick? And of course, there's allergies, there's all sorts of things. But do you, you know, how, how should somebody who is, is breastfeeding or, or is bottle feeding but is in close contact with their baby, do you think they should act differently if they do start to feel some symptoms coming on? Um, I think temperature screenings are important. Um, I think maybe trialing a little, you know, one-time dose of Claritin if there's or, uh, an antihistamine if there are some symptoms to see if that, you know, would alleviate if this is like a pollen issue or what have you. Um, but if, if things are persistent over the course of a day or two, then, and certainly if there's a fever, that sort of a no-brainer, but if there are sort of mild respiratory symptoms, colds, cough, aches, um, if they're persistent for a day or two, then I reach out to a physician um, via telemed or what have you and, um, and see if you can get, to get tested or evaluated virtually or in person. Thank you. And um, somebody did ask a question about if they're interested in formula, if you recommend any particular type, I know some people do and some people don't. Um, so that, that is I the never, I don't have brand preferences. I mean, the, the standard is to start a traditional cow's milk based formula, but um, I don't have a specific recommendation that one is better than, than another choice at this point. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, and then just, I guess, in general, any, any last things that, you know, you would suggest for families at this time as they're either preparing to have their baby, any other, any other things that you think anybody needs to know or that we want to leave people with? And actually, if anybody else has a last question, um, you know, please let us know. I'm also going to give you our Booper website as well and a code um, for your first visit. So I'm just putting that out there. Um, but does anybody out there have any other questions for us? Anything for Dr. Capiola or birth doula? I'm a birth doula, post doula, can answer that. Um, or lactation or pediatric questions. And hi, Paige. Hi, Paige. 
Hi. So uh, we have a question here for Dr. Capiola. Is there a book or app you prefer for a week by week guide for newborns to see the milestones? Oh, that's a good one. Um, that's a good one. Hmm. Early on, babies don't do very much. So in the first few weeks, you're basically talking about a baby who is eating, sleeping, and pooping. Um, and we don't do much sort of developmentally other than the things that you're gonna probably naturally do. Lots of snuggles, um, lots of holding, you're not gonna spoil your newborn. But in those first few weeks, babies don't need specific developmental stimulation other than, like I said, the stuff that you're naturally going to do. About a month of age, then we start things like tummy time. But at each of your checkups, your pediatrician should be doing anticipatory guidance. Like, here's what to expect, and here's what you should be doing over the coming few months to stimulate your child's development. Um, and then those, the developmental screening at the following visit, you'll sort of know what things you, you know, you'll know what to look out for so that you're prepared for those questions that should happen at each of your or well baby checks. And then we give like the Cliff's Notes version of what, you know, of what developmentally you should be doing to, you know, help stimulate your baby. Yeah. Thank you. And I see one other question, uh, two other questions. Which breastfeeding items should we have on hand for the birth? Example, pillow, nipple shields, et cetera. Are there any things you recommend? I think a pillow is the most important. Everything else you can order and get pretty quickly. And the hospital lactation consultants have things like nipple shields if that's necessary. But if you're going to need something like that, it should definitely be with the guidance of an LC. Yes. or a pediatrician that, you know, is experienced with that. Yeah, we really recommend if you, you know, if you know yourself to have flatter nipples um, or, oh, there's a baby, <laughs> <laughs> you know, or that you might need nipple shields, um, you definitely do want to be working in consult with a lactation consultant um, at the time due to the fact that when you're using the shields, that may be the thing that helps you breastfeed, but we also sometimes don't see proper drainage of the breast um, and may need to advise you in different ways you know, in terms of pumping and other such things. So definitely exactly. using that, you want to be reaching out to a, a consultant. Um, and you probably, if you haven't ordered your, you know, a breast pump already with your insurance that is covered. Um, so, you know, you should have a breast pump, but you don't need to bring it to the hospital. Um, they do have them there if they need to. Um, and also just because you have a breast pump doesn't mean you should use it all the time. So that is, I think, one of the issues with everybody having breast pumps is we're all maybe feel like we need to use them right away and and we really want to we don't need to unless we need to <laughs> the haka can be a very good tool though and for like an under 20 dollar item i think everyone should have one because even if it's an epic fail and it goes in the garbage it's not a waste i love so that i like that I, lo I love the haka here's your tip if you decide to get a haka make sure that when you're using it you need to actually flip it um, oh, my boob is way back there. So um, <laughs> I'll show my other boob, but you want to make sure that you flip it. And then when you place it on, you go, and that way that suction's on. And while you're breastfeeding, then on one side, you can be catching your extra milk on the other side, or you can use it to kind of squeeze and pump. So it is really great. So that, I, I love the haka. All right. Uh, somebody asked about books or online resources for sleep help to assist with forming a good sleep pattern for baby. I guess that, that could be our last question and then we'll. Some parents eventually get into like an eat sleep play pattern, but in the beginning it's all blended together. So what your baby does, whether it's if you're breastfeeding, snooze, letting the baby snooze on the breast, you can't really do it incorrectly. Um, if the baby's gaining and growing, getting in that requisite eight to 12 feet a day, making the wet and dirty diapers, there isn't a particular pattern that you need to follow. And there's no particular amount of time on the breast that is like the right amount. Some babies can drain a best very quickly and some moms let down and milk flow is slower and takes, and the baby is less efficient at sort of getting the milk from the breast. So babies can nurse a long time, a brief time, just as we take small bites and have snacks and eat bigger meals, they do the same. So there's no like amount of time that's the right amount. 
Yeah, and if you do need a, a sleep consultant, do feel free to reach out to, to Boober. While they're not on the platform at the moment, we have lots of people that we refer to. If that's somebody, at, when you get to that place, most people recommend not really going into a full kind of a sleep training program until you're past this fourth trimester, um, you know, so giving it the, those first 12 weeks, although this is variable and it depends on everybody's life, what they need to do for themselves. So sometimes you do need a little earlier extra support. Um, with sleep, but we are also teaching, I teach an infant sleep 101 class, just about normal newborn sleep patterning. Um, so that's one thing you could come to you and just check out or, you know, or reach out to us separately and we'll be happy to find somebody to connect you to. All right. All right. Well, I just, I want to step in and thank you both so much for such important, vital information for all of the new and expecting moms out there. And I want to give both Jada and Dr. Julia a plug. Um, in regards to Jada, if you're looking for support around delivery, um, if you're looking for support around breastfeeding, please look at Birthday Presents and Boober because they are leading the charge. And I have to give a special shout out to Dr. Julie as I started with the pediatrician to my near and dear children. Mm -hmm. um, Premier Pediatrics covers Brooklyn in a couple of locations and Manhattan as well. They are such an amazing- We have a Rockaway yeah. location and then in Brooklyn and in Manhattan, exactly. So thank yeah. you, PH, thanks so much. Yeah, are you kidding? You guys are the best. And to compliment, cause I feel like so much of what might a little bit be missing just from the general conversation these days is like, there's the physical and the emotional. And instead of looking at them as separates, like as much as we can bring them together as a whole, as noon expecting moms are, cha are challenged by and, go and navigating the whole physical aspect, there's an emotional aspect as well. And so if anybody out there is struggling with anxiety, depression, hopelessness, helplessness, um, feeling irritable, angry, that's what we do at the Motherhood Center. We're here to help you navigate those emotional and um, you know, mental health struggles that we go through as we transition to parenthood. So you got the full gamut here. Um, and I can't thank you both enough for everything you've done and everything that you've shared with our audience. Uh, and um, do you uh, just, you, you guys, do you wanna give any last um, shout outs about how people can find you? Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, you, so for me, and I, I'll drop it into the chat, and I'll, I put Premier Pediatrics, Dr. Kepiola, um, but if you want to drop in the, the website, feel free. And also, you know, Premier Pediatrics has their program called The First Month, which is also really, um, really great as well, that, that this particular practice really works to bring all of the complementary therapies and different kinds of support that you guys need, which I think is so amazing. So we'll get the website there. Um, um while well, you find it, I'll say um, that you can find me at, like we said, Boober and birthday presents. And really, if you need a virtual birth doula, um, and, and birth doulas can make a huge difference in a virtual sphere. I know it sounds kind of strange, but if you haven't thought about it, um, birth doulas also are really working with people to prepare them prenatally and can help you even try to really figure out when to go to the place of birth. So it's possible just to work with a doula virtually before leaving, if that's something if you don't want to necessarily bring the whole doula virtually with you. Um, although I think it's a great option, virtual postpartum doula or virtual lactation consultant. So there you have, um, and I think I put my, my websites before. So, so please reach out. Thanks for having us, Paige. Yeah. Oh, thank and you for coming, you so everybody. And thanks Mother for everybody for joining. such an amazing place. So go, you know, if you need, if you need anybody there, Paige is an amazing resource. So thank you so much. All, All right. right. Everybody, have a great rest Bye. of the evening. Bye now. Bye. Bye. Take care. Bye.